Our meeting of Rotary at St. Petersburg International is officially open. Welcome everybody. We've got about 18 people. We're probably gonna get a few more stragglers who'll come in just a little bit late because some people have a tendency to do that. At Rotary meetings, it's kind of interesting. When I joined in 2004 in the state of Colorado in the United States, if you showed up late, it cost you a dollar. You had to give a dollar for being late. No pin, no medal, no signia on you, had to pay a dollar to come in, you know? If you had to leave early out of the meeting, you had to pay a dollar to leave. That little money would come in slowly, 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 but we had about 30 members, but it would build up and it gave us a few dollars to spend on some local projects just by collecting a few sums for a few things. So most of the time people showed up on time, stayed the full time and didn't leave early. So, and they had some kind of badge on or pin on. And if they didn't, of course, we had the big round rotary badges, but that didn't count. We gave that to you after you showed up. You had to show up with some kind of pin or some kind of marking. A lot of customs at Rotary are different around the world. If you go to Russia, if you go to Spain, if you go to Philippines, if you go to India, and I have been to Rotary clubs in all those countries, including Malaysia and Singapore. And each one of the Rotary clubs are just a little bit different. Some sing songs, some open with a pledge, some do different things. It's interesting as you travel to find these things. But when we travel on Zoom, we don't get a chance to actually see these cultures. We're seeing faces. Right now, I'm talking to all of you, you got 20 people on board. I'm talking to 20 individuals on 20 different lines. That's in reality. Because when you look at it, you're talking, you're looking at me talking. Well, eventually we're going to get back to our meeting where we can actually give somebody a hug or shake their hand or pat them on the back or something about being friendly with them. That's coming. We don't know when it's coming, but it's going to come. We're never going to be 100% Zoom for the rest of our lives. I don't believe that. I think we will get together. We might have both. We might have hybrids where sometimes you have a few people there and sometimes people are on Zoom also. We may have both. But what we need to remember is that even though we have all these differences, different clubs, different languages, different cultures, different clothes styles, we are all humans. In this case, we are all Rotarians and we're all trying to help people be better off. We're trying to give service. And that's what bonds us together. That's what brings us to unity. One of the things I found when I joined Rotary was didn't matter which country I went to, if I walked into a Rotary meeting, I immediately was welcome, immediately. I mean, people wanted to shake my hand, ask me where I was from, they were friendly, give me food. It was very, very nice. And if you need help, I know I got my Rotary card in my wallet. If I was in a country and needed help, I take out that Rotary call card and find the number of a Rotarian in that country, I immediately got help. So it's very, very nice to know that once you're a Rotarian, once you're participating, that people all over the world are helping you. And I'm learning slowly now that Toastmasters is almost the same way. Not quite, but almost. It's also a friendly group of people that will help you in need. So that's why the, the presidents of the Rotary and, and Toastmaster two years ago, almost two years now, decided that we will try to work together because both clubs have a lot of things in common. So we'll see how that develops in the next few years with Toastmasters and Rotary. I don't ever think they're gonna be one club, but I do think they're gonna be a little bit more cooperative and work on more projects together. So that's my opening comments. Welcome everybody. I'm glad to see all your smiling faces tonight. We're gonna to have an interesting trio of speakers tonight, not one, but three. So maybe it'll be three times as good. And we're gonna find out about somebody named Pushkin in the wrong country. I'm not quite sure how that works, but we're gonna find out because they say that he's in Canada. Why the heck would they go to Canada? The only thing I can reason go push him and go to Canada is because it's the same latitude, it's about the same temperature. Otherwise, I don't know why he would go to Canada. He, he should have gone to the Caribbean or somewhere warm or somewhere, I'm not sure. We're gonna find out about that later this evening. So let me go to my president's comments. Get my slide up here one second. Uh, and this evening, my opening comments, you've heard of a little bit of it. And what I'd like to tell you is that 
it's pets season, P-E-T-S. All you Rotarians know what that is. And president-elects need to be going to training and other people are going to need to get training. And it's that time of year when we're preparing people for the next generation of leaders, the next presidents, the next secretary, the next treasurer, the next project chairman, all those positions that we're going to be filling as of 1 July. Now is the time to start selecting those people, getting them trained and get going so we can have a smooth transition from one year to the next year. So if you're not already in, uh, looking at the pet schedule, you should, and you probably already know it better than I do. So uh, right now I have an offer, I mean, not an offer, I have a request. If there's anybody out there who is having pets training in English, if they would allow another person who's not in your region, not in your district to join your pets and get certified for going through pets, please let me know. Okay, I need to attend one. I've already went through one, but I need to go through another one for another year. And I need a pets to go through, but I need an English speaking pets. So if somebody on the screen knows of one. And if you talk to your district director and he says, yes, we'll take an outsider, please send me an uh, email or text and I'll be happy to change my day night schedule so that I can attend your pets because I'd like to go through and do that. Uh, otherwise I will do some other methodology to make it happen. But if you have that available, please, please let us know. And we have been asking other people already. So we're looking for that. Okay. Now, another thing about tonight's meeting, tonight's meeting started just a couple minutes late, but we're probably going to finish a little bit early. Normally we finish around 8.30 hour time, which is an hour and a half. And then we could bits or chat for another 10 or 15 minutes. Tonight, we're probably going to finish a little bit earlier. We don't have a lot of news about our projects. We're not taking a lot of news up front because there's not much to go out right now, but we have three speakers who are going to spend most of the time telling us about the secret place where Pushkin went to. But anyway, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna to listen to them. It should be very interesting, but we're probably gonna finish a little bit early this evening, just for you, those folks who time schedule is quite a bit different than ours, just for your information. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Randall and ask him to do his secretary thing and go go forward from there young man it is all your screen randall well in the spirit of brevity i don't have anything special to add except <laughs> welcome everyone who's here today <laughs> no news huh mama used to say no news is good news i'm not sure if that's right or not right but uh, you have no nothing to add right nothing okay all right and and all i'm sure all of you or at least most of you on the screen you get the emails from Randall each week after we post our meetings. And when you do that, he does put in the updates, the meetings, the speakers, the information, what's coming, uh, what's going on. We will talk about our one project that we have, our one large project. We'll talk about that after the speakers are done. But um, like I said, not a, lot of, not, not a lot of news going right now. Just out of curiosity, and this is my own curiosity now, not everybody else's, I'd like to see a raise of hands of those people on screen. How many of you have got at least one of the virus shots? How many people got a shot? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Okay, seven, okay, seven, seven out of 22, okay? Going in the right direction. I'm not gonna say one way or the other how you feel about it or if you feel about it, I'm not gonna ask. I was just kind of curious among the folks who who are um, uh, going to do it. I'm going to be getting mine in the middle of April, the middle of next month. So that's when I'll get my shot. So, okay. I guess a time for me to do something that we normally do at the beginning of our meetings every time we do this. So let me go to screen share and let me find my slide. And let me go to our four-way test. For anybody new, I'll give you the instructions. I'm going to read the four-way test one at a time. And after I say it, I need for you to repeat it. So if everybody will turn on your microphones at this time, everybody, please turn on your microphones. Every, all microphones open. There we go. Okay. So the four-way test of things that we think, say, and do. The first one, is it the truth? Is it, is it the truth? truth? Is it the truth? 
Is it fair to all concerned? Is it, is it fair, fair, fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Very good. Thank you very, very much for participating. I appreciate that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I have said in previous meetings, we don't know in the future if we're going to sing a song or do a dance, but right now what we're doing is reading the four-way <laughs> test when we start. And we just want to remind everybody that if you live by those and work by those rules, it may not prove that you're going to get rich, but it's going to make working with people a whole lot easier. So we encourage everybody to think about that as they're doing their normal business. Okay, I'm going to go back to my screen where I was and uh, let me see what I get here. I need to go to the next slide. Yeah, here we go. Our presentation this evening is called, and that last word, is that Quinty or Quinti? Quinty? How's that pronounced, somebody? Quinty. 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 All right. Yeah, Quinty. I Quinty. thought it might be. I wasn't quite sure. So the Pushkins and Quinty. We have three people who are going to be speaking to us tonight, Antonina, Renya, and Sergey, and they're going to talk about, I'm not quite sure what, but they're going to be talking about Pushkin and anything, I don't care what it is, is interesting about Pushkin. Those of us who live here in St. Petersburg, we know that you can go to the Pushkin Museum and gardens and the beautiful place they have here. And for them of you who have come here and visit have also gone through the gardens and the, the uh, it's not a castle, but it's a large mansion and the park. It's a beautiful place to visit. So I'm not sure what they're gonna talk about, but our speakers tonight, the first one I wanna talk about is Antonina. And Antonina is an honorary member of this club. Now it's in the process, it hasn't been finalized, but it's going to happen very, very soon because she has been working with us for a number of months. So that's, that's in the works and that will happen very, very shortly. Antonina is just a person who loves to help people. And she was, she come originally from Tomsk, Siberia, you know that, most of you know where Tomsk is, that's in Southern Siberia. And after that, she immigrated to Canada in 1999 and settled in Belleville and founded the Canadian Russian Culture Society. She's still active. You know, she probably did that when she was a young girl. It was only uh, 22 years ago. She was a little girl in 22 years ago. She's still a young girl, still very, very active. And we're looking forward to hear from her tonight. The second speaker, or not second speaker, but the second of the speakers is gonna be Renya. And she has a middle name that's interesting. It's called PhD. Um, she's a multiple, multiple disciplinarian. I'm not sure I wanted her as a teacher when I was little, if she's a disciplinarian, I'm not sure about that. For 40 years, excuse me, for 20 years, she's been offering customized educational experiences at Hollowell Gardens. She has taught at two of the Ontario universities since 1989. I don't know how that's possible, Ren. You're not that old. You can't be teaching in 1989. Independent. <laughs> she's an independent research into the neurosciences of language learning. That ought to be interesting. Uh, I, I teach communication sometimes and uh, neuroscience of language learning would be interesting for me to hear about. The third of our speakers is Sergey. Sergey was born in 1961 in St. Petersburg. Now he has traveled a lot. He's got a master's degree in philosophy. He moved to Estonia, Tallinn. I've been in Tallinn, nice place. His particular interest is in the intercultural relations and influences between Leningrad region of Russia and Estonia from the 18th century up to present. So between the three of them, they're gonna make the presentation tonight. I don't know which order they're going to speak. I'm going to clear out of, oh, I'm sorry, I got one more slide to show you. I forgot to show you three lovely people. Let me move this out of the way here. Three lovely people. You can see Antonina, Renya, and Sergey. And they don't look any different except for when I didn't recognize Renya. I'd seen her picture, but I never seen her live. And tonight when she came on board, I said, hmm, I wonder who that is. So she has changed her looks a little bit, but she still looks beautiful. Dark hair, silver hair, all fine. So we're gonna go out of here and go into your presentation. Randall, are we set up for them to take over? You are, thumbs up. Okay, 
I don't know which one of you three is going to take over, but the screen is yours. Go forward to your presentation. May I share my screen? Yes, please do. Yeah. So I go to files. Okay. And I'm very sorry. Anthony, you have to open the file first. Files. Open the file on, on, from your application PowerPoint, if that's what you're using. Okay, just a moment. Give me a time, please. I'm not so experienced in such things. Thank you. Relax, relax. I open my file. Then you have to so, press, there's a green button on the bottom of your of Zoom, which it just says a share screen, and then from there you select whichever application, whichever screen you want to share. But you cannot see it right here, so share screen. You, now you yes. will, you have a choice. Okay, so. I, I can see it now. Thank you very much. Okay, yes. and we go to slideshow. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, guten Tag. Dobry wieczór. Buenos dias. How I sound? Too loud? Too cracky? It's OK. Just go it's ahead. Fine. Oh, OK. So uh, introduction already was done. Thank you very much, Michael. And I will go straight to idea of starting Canadian-Russian Culture Society in Vilnius. And it was dictated uh, by the reason that uh, it was a um, big gap uh, in knowledge about ordinary people of modern Russian-speaking world, to my opinion, missing at the time in local community of Quincy. So after the number of Russian events around Belleville and Quincy and publications in media, uh, I kind of became known as a Russian lady for many locals. Of course, as all scholars from the post-Soviet countries and many people worldwide, I knew the name Alexander Pushkin. So it was natural for me in 2003, after receiving a phone call from Marco Holloway to rush to their home on Church Street in Belleville hosting Alexander Pushkin's granddaughter, Irina. And here, we met Irina, a stroke survivor, who had definitely a long, challenging past and mystery surrounding her family room. To me, she made impression as a person always keeping a sunshine attitude a hard worker, provider for herself and her mother, and party girl. So me, Irina, and Margot became friends for the last years of Irina's life, still wondering about the mystery of the past, which can't be cleared due to Irina's challenging memory, capabilities, and speech. However, this friendship inspired to organize a number of public Pushkin's cultural events in Belgium. 
Greece and without Irina during following years. After Irina passing away in 2006, uh, me and uh, my Russian, Spanish, English speaking friend, Luba Vanna Maker, helped Marco to finalize the estate of Irina by connecting with Irina's sister, Ala, in Venezuela. Marco passed to me Irina's archive, including legal documents, letters, and photographs. Unfortunately, they didn't explain how Irina and her mother, named Yekaterina, were connected to the great Russian poet and writer, Alexander Pushkin. The oldest friends of Pushkin family in town Picton died out due to age, so it was really nobody to ask. The call to Pushkin Museum in St. Petersburg, performed by Galina Zhaklinkova, my daughter residing there, got called reaction. No interest and first time the word imposters being pronounced. What's next? So I just kept archive preserved until I received the call from Renia Taminsky eight years later. Tene, please. Thank you, Auntie Nina. So going back in time, oh, you go back to the other slide, Auntie Nina. Ant Antonina, can you go back? Yes, 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 I'm trying. Okay. Uh, just to say, I also arrived in this area around the same time. Um, I came from Toronto, bought a house in 2000 in Picton. There we go. Um, in Eastern Ontario. So it's an island right at the bottom of, um, of the map of Ontario here. And I bought it as a, um, because it's a large heritage historic property, I bought it to give educational experiences to newcomers to Canada. Um, I've been working with, with newcomers and refugees in the Toronto area since 1989. And my interest is in how adults learn English. English is a particularly difficult language to learn for a number of reasons. And that's why I got involved in a specific type of listening training, which has a scientific basis. Um, and uh, I use music a lot in what I do as well. So it's very trauma informed, which makes it more effective for working with, with refugees to Canada. So next slide. So in, there we go. In uh, 2006, I was reading the local paper and I came across this obituary and it stopped me in my tracks. Um, I had studied Russian at university for five years in my first, uh, my first round of university at the University of Toronto. Then I had moved to Europe for a number of years and then came back to Toronto. So I had kind of left behind my, uh, my Russian connections while I went into a PhD program in the study of religion. So here I am in Picton, I just moved here full time. I see this obituary and I was really taken aback. So I got in touch with um, a woman who wrote for the newspaper, Margot Hall, uh, Haylock, after, Margaret Haylock, uh, after I saw an article about these two women living in, in Picton. Okay, um, and the, the address 
in the obituary is actually very close to my house. It's within a few minutes walk. So this is the neighborhood. I was trying to imagine these two women with these remarkable connections coming to, to Canada in the early 1950s after going through the war and so forth, establishing themselves here, what were they surrounded by? Unfortunately, the house they lived in no longer exists. It's been replaced by a beer store. So I, I really couldn't imagine their exact life. But this is what they would have seen, including my house in the bottom two pictures, because my house was built in 1901. So I was getting a sense that, well, one part of their life wasn't bad. It's actually a very nice area. And there were beautiful houses in small towns, 4,000 people. Okay, but what really made me wonder, what about the other parts of their life? Next slide, Antonina. So Irina uh, came here, they both came here because she had been working in the Bata shoe factory in uh, Czechoslovakia. And Thomas Bata, who had settled in, this, in uh, Quinty, um, Oak had a, a shoe factory in Picton, and he offered the opportunity for uh, workers in his factory in Europe to come to Canada to work in his factories here. So that factory was right across from her residence, and it also doesn't exist. The building is now replaced by the hospital clinic, which I go to when I have to. So. Um, so I had a sense of, okay, what she saw every day, more or less, but I really wondered, how was she received? How were the two of them received in this small town, Ontario, uh, very, very few immigrants in this area, even in 2000, when I moved here. So back then, they would have really stood out especially as people who didn't speak English at all or well. And I assume she probably learning as an adult didn't really speak it that well either. Okay, so next slide. But when I had contacted Margaret Haylock, the journalist, she had put me in touch with uh, Margot Holloway in Belleville, who had been Irina's landlady. And I called her and she said she had a whole lot of documents and, and uh, photographs and so forth. And she was going through them and throwing a lot out. And I said, don't throw them out. This might be important. So I made an appointment to go and see her. We sat and talked for a couple of hours. She allowed me to take anything I thought was important. And this was one of the photographs. So now I, I got an impression. She was an attractive young woman. Here she is in another photograph. She was obviously dating. Um, and, uh, so she, and she has a beautiful smile. So that gave me a sense that she was a person who fit in. She was kind of the life of the party. She had a lot of good energy. And I could see that as a family trait, knowing what I know about Pushkin in terms of his, his glamorous social life. So, so that gave me a sense of who she was. On the other hand, here's the, uh, the identity certificate for her mother who had worked as a cook, and that was put down as her, her uh, occupation. And none of the photos that I saw in the newspaper clippings or any of the or photos that I've seen ever showed her smiling except for one. So my sense was that she did not adapt that well. Um, and that she was lonely. In one of the articles, it said she stayed in the apartment watching soap operas most of the time. And 
in spite of that, she lived to uh, quite a long life, which uh, very impressive. But I really wondered about her emotional state as, as an immigrant to this country struggling with the English language. Uh, and I'm sure the relationship between these two women was quite extraordinary, no matter what, that Irina kind of made it her life purpose to cheer up her mother and, and help her adapt because of her natural ebullience and, and uh, joyful character. So that gave me a sense of who, who they were. But whether or not there was still a Pushkin connection was really still a question in my mind. So I went to the local bookstore and picked up this biography because at the beginning of it, there are a couple of family trees. So uh, you can go on to that next. There we go. So at the beginning of the biography, there's, there's a family tree from the, the ancestor, Ganibal. And on another page, next slide, there's the Pushkin family. So I studied these, trying to figure it out, and still could not see where Irina and Yekaterina could fit into this picture. So it was still a question mark. And here was the uh, collected works that I inherited of, of Irina's and I went through them to see if there were any markings or anything written. I mean, it's a later edition, a Soviet edition, but nothing, nothing I could see uh, that, that really told me that indeed they were part of the Pushkin family, um, famous poets family. <laughs> So um, here's, here's the cemetery where they're, where they're buried. It's a beautiful historic cemetery. And uh, that's, that's the headstone, uh, the, the one in the front is the headstone for the two of them. And next slide. And here's, here's a close up of it. Um, but uh, it was still, you know, it, it, was a, it was a big mystery about what, what had happened. Um, and then there was a, um, an article in our local paper again about a walking tour that had taken place in, in the cemetery. And uh, Celine Papuszewska, who's on the call with us to, today, was portraying Yekaterina Pushkin. Well, in an internet search, as I, as I remember it, maybe he'll correct me, Sergei had seen that article, had contacted Margaret Haylock, and Margaret Haylock had, uh, had given him my phone number to contact me about it. So now, with that phone call, eight years later, I finally got an answer that yes, indeed, there may well be a connection. And Sergei was working very hard at establishing that for his Pushkin biography. So where to go next um, was about whether, whether or not we could bring this together. Now, this was a quote, uh, is a quote from Pushkin. I had never seen it before. It's also in the Binion biography. And it's Pushkin himself talking about biography. And I thought this, this is so relevant because all we had to go by for Irina and Yekaterina, well, Antonina and I, was a sense of who they were as newcomers to Canada, how they had adapted, et cetera. They, they claimed they were part of the famous family. We didn't know that for sure. Uh, and here's Pushkin saying, leave it to the biographers to, to talk about my, my emotional life, my social life, and that sort of thing. That's not of interest for my readers. And here we are 
more than a century later, looking at, at the biography of these two possible descendants of the family. And all we've got to go by is exactly that. So I thought it was a lovely irony, worthy of Nabokov. So <laughs> here we go, Sergei up next. I, I'm on microphone. Antonina, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So here is uh, Sergei's short bio. Uh, as uh, Michael already read before the meeting. Uh, but what I also would like to highlight is his uh, prime current interest in the influence of the Baltic government on the development of the Imperial Russia between 1710 and 1918. He also published a book on this subject. Um, in 2000, uh, in published historical articles of Tartu University, Sergei found names of Pushkin's relatives being in Estonia after 1917 and heard a comment from Russian historian, imposters know after 15 years of work, including his own research in archives in Estonia and Russia, and based on documents, received by myself and collected by Rania from Marco in Canada, he completed and published the real, based on facts, story of true Pushkin in Quincy. Here it comes. Alexander Pushkin has a younger brother Lev of many talents himself also greatly supporting Alexander in a promotion of poet's work. During any time, seven very turbulent ones, including three wars and revolution in 15 years, all on territory of Russia, people still were falling to blood. So in 1909, the grandson of Lev Pushkin, named Alexander after his family, great uncle, started his own family in St. Petersburg in Russia after marrying Epitina or Chichina, with three children born, Allah in 1910. Alexander, 1912, and Irina, 1913. The father in the family, Alexander Pushkin, professional military, uh, hussar, cavalry officer, took part in World War I, was wounded, recovered, then taught at the military school with many famous people, rejected the socialistic October revolution in 1917, and joined White Liberation Army and was killed in one of the battles in 1919. The widow, young widow, Ekaterina Pushkin, his three young children now face the brutality of the civil war and it's never free. So as the other imperial loyalists did, including Shalabin, Bunin, Rachmaninov, and one million white Russians spreading all over the world and Europe, when escaping from new regime established by Bolshevik party in favor of workers 
peasants and soldiers. So she joined thousands of refugees moving to Estonia. And Estonia is nearby country uh, close to St. Petersburg. On the way in country village Gazdestina, uh, near Nabokov estate, she left the only son who got sick with some remote relatives, hoping to reunite, to reunite them. After settling his daughters Alla and Irina in Estonia, it took seven years for Ekaterina to bring Alexander over to Estonia. Here comes the celebration of 120th Jubilee of Great Alexander Pushkin and establishment of the Pushkin concept of education in Estonia. And they boosted interest of white immigrant community to the Pushkin family. Amount of money donated to this family was enough to bring young Alexander to Estonia. So family reunited in 1926. In the meantime, names of Yekaterina and young Alexander Pushkin were used by immigrant leaders for their political agenda against Red Russia. It motivated Yekaterina to publish the letter in the local newspaper asking to leave her son and family in peace. And it happened. Since then, the interest to this particular line of Pushkin family was lost. Yekaterina, the mother, taught at school for children of immigrants, where also her children received the basic education. must say that former refugees, so-called Russian Estonians, greatly impacted culture, industry, military, law, education, and system of Estonia in 1920-1930. The whole Pushkin family got Estonian citizenship in 1936. Irina worked at Bata shoe factory in Tallinn. Alla married a wealthy pharmacist and truly enjoyed her luxury home filled with furniture and artwork collected from Tsar Palace in Gatchina. Alexander Ushuri as they were called in the family, served in Estonian army, worked at the factory, and married Claudia Leonova in 1940. He was very close with his younger sister, Irina. Now the World War II entered territory of Baltic countries, already included into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. Shurik was recruited into the Red Army and vanished with no traces, as many soldiers did one month later. In 1944, Yekaterina and Irina Pushkin moved to Germany to the camp for displaced people, as many white Russians did, rejecting the opportunity to stay with Estonia as part of USSR. Alla and her husband immigrated to Venezuela, where they stayed till the rest of their life. Yekaterina wrote and sent a letter to the Pushkin 
equality in the United States, asking for help and immigration to USA. Please, no reply. Irina decided to move to Canada to work at Bata Shoe Factory. To do so, she changed her year old birth and became 20 years year old. Acceptable for recruiters, as they hired European women in age under 30 only. Since then, her new date of birth became 1919 instead of 1913. The mother, Ekaterina, stayed in camp in Germany for one year longer until extremely hard working Irina collected enough money to bring her to Canada. Since then, they never part and live together till the death of Yekaterina at age of 103. She was famous and Daniel in prison. Here is a picture of Yekaterina Pushkin the mother when she lived in Ontario, Canada, from 1948 to 1999. Time to time, Alla visited them from Venezuela. Yekaterina Pushkin, age of 93, here on this picture, is surrounded by photographs of her family. Here is Irina uh, and her family story finally unfolded and published. So a true great grand niece of the Russian poet Alexander Pushkin, she was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, and she died in Vinci, Canada. Recent 1921 sorry, picture made by Irina. This is the picture of the gravestone of Irina and Ekaterina Pushkin at the Glenwood Cemetery in Picton. And you can see the date of birth here is 1919 not 1913 as it should be. So in 2015, all archive of Irina Pushkin and Ekaterina Pushkin and related documents collected in Estonia were donated to the Pushkin Museum in Bodina in Russia. And now, Sergey, it's your part. Hey. Uh, I, I hope that you hear me all. Do you? Yes, yep. Sergey. Yes, yes okay. we do. Yep. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, from Canada, Irene and Antonina and um, uh, others for keeping the archive, although they were not sure that uh, uh, the documents belong to the real representatives of the Pushkin's family. Um, my idea was uh, that I was studying uh, the immigration from Russia into Estonia, uh, since I uh, myself live in Estonia, but I was born in St. Petersburg. So, uh, I was studying uh, some prominent um, people from that immigration, their lives and so on. And um, Pushkin is a f uh, surname which is uh, familiar to all of Russians. I do not know how much uh, the international audience know who Pushkin is. Uh, actually, he is uh, the founder of the uh, modern Russian uh, literature. Uh, maybe he is not uh, so well known uh, abroad 
uh, as, for example, Leo Tolstoy or uh, Nabokov. But no, uh, he uh, is if, you don't mind my interjecting. Are. He's considered one of the founders of, of modern European literature as, as well as just Russian. So he's very, very well known internationally. Okay. And by extension in North America as well. Okay, yes. Um, it, it is, um, uh, I think, mostly due to uh, some uh, musical uh, uh, pieces of art by Tchaikovsky, for example, uh, who created an opera, uh, Eugene Onegin, based on uh, Pushkin's uh, uh, novel. But still, um, uh, I would like to explain why it is uh, so important to learn not only about uh, his own life and biography, but also about the biography uh, and lives of his ancestors and descendants. Yes. Uh, the biographies of his ancestors uh, were important to him. He created many uh, pieces of literature uh, in connection with the, his uh, family's history. And uh, when we know uh, the roots of uh, him and his family, we know uh, many, uh, we understand better many of his uh, works. But when we learn uh, the lives of his descendants or the descendants of uh, his brother, we know more what happened to the country, to Russia. And I try to, um, uh, I also uh, published some articles uh, in that connection to show uh, the destruction of the Russian culture under communism. And uh, it was important, of course, to prove somehow that uh, you know, these uh, uh, Pushkins from Estonia were really related to the great Russian poet and writer. And thanks to uh, Antonina and Drenia's uh, efforts, it was done. Then I could uh, uh, prove it to uh, some museum uh, scholars in Russia based on uh, the archive from Canada and uh, some other documents also found in, uh, which I found in Estonia. And uh, in, two, uh, in 2020 in Moscow, there was published a new edition of the encyclopedia of the Pushkin's family. Uh, the, only that fact shows you uh, how important uh, Pushkin is for the Russian culture that a special encyclopedia is created, concentrated on only one family. And the articles about um, Irina Pushkin and uh, her mother Ekaterina and um, Alla and their brother Alexander it was included into that encyclopedia and you can see here on the slide uh, the front page of it. it, it were, they were just five articles, maybe six out of uh, many others, but uh, they became possible thanks to this international project by three of us, maybe some more people, from Canada and Estonia. And you see uh, by this fact that Pushkin still unite, unites people uh, in all over the world. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So uh, we already heard the comments of the great poet Alexander Pushkin regarding his huge biographer. However, the story unfolded uh, as uh, already Sergei told us. Uh, this the story unfolded showed us 
how small our world is. For example, isn't it interesting that the great Russian poet and writer Alexander Pushkin, as well as his brother Lev and our Irina and Alpo Ala Pushkin, are descendants of a former African slave, Ganibal. Even in description of Lev Pushkin, who is great grandfather of Irina, his friend Delvik mentioned the appearance of Lev as an African man painted with white paint. Nothing in the human world is traceless. The life story of Goldina or Quinty, maybe Pushkin's, connects us today, highlighting human migration as a powerful tool of cultural enrichment, and that human world is interconnected much tighter than we think. Thank you all for your interest and time. Just wanted and to add that based, based, information. Yes, based yes. on the the archive, uh, which um, I also received from um, Antonina from Canada, I also wrote an article about uh, uh, Nabokov and uh, also about the relations between Yekaterina Pushkin in Canada and her friend um, um, in Stockholm, an Estonian immigrant who was a mother-in-law to a Swedish uh, filmmaker, Bergman. That's wow. very interesting. Another proof that uh, people are interconnected in the world. Sergei, where can people find that article? Can, can, can we, Antonina, can you close the screen share so we can see each other and then we can chat, we can ask questions. Antonina, can you show, there you go. Thank you very much, Antonina. Okay, somebody had a question about where we can find an article. Who had the question? It was me, okay. uh, Renya. Who's yeah. asking? Renya. Yeah, but who, who are you asking? Oh, Sergei. Oh, <laughs> it, uh, I, I, I published it in uh, a local newspaper here uh, in Leningrad region in Russian. I can send you uh, a link to it or just an article in PDF uh, file you. to you Great. if you want. Yes, please. Okay, okay. First, of all, first of all, I'd like for all of us to give Antonina, Renya and Sergey a round of applause for a great meeting presentation day. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. Oh, bravo, 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 bravo. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And and uh, we, we appreciate it because for most of the people here on the screen, I can't say most, all the people here on the screen know who Pushkin is. We may not know a lot about them, but we know who they are. We've heard the name and we've heard a little bit of their history. And now we know a whole lot more about them. What I'd like to do is open the floor up to questions for a little while. So we have three experts here um, who know the history and we'd like to ask some questions. Randall, you're the first person with your hand up. Go ahead and ask your question, Randall. I'm so happy to be the first person to ask a question. First, a <laughs> comment. I was really fascinated uh, and you explained later on in the presentation why uh, Yekaterina's family name when she immigrated to Canada, the surname was Chicken. So I thought going through life in Canada with her father's name as Chicken, that seemed very strange. Was he Kurica? But it was Chicken, Chicken. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned uh, Antonina, and maybe Urenia is the best person to answer this. You talked about the Pushkin concept of education that was started uh, or a school was launched uh, or a program was launched in Estonia. What is the Pushkin approach to education? Pushkin yeah. approach to education, maybe it's better that, that I answer this. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, one of uh, the issues why I um, excavated this story uh, so uh, profoundly. It was the uh, concept of national education of the uh, uh, Russian uh, expatriate uh, children. Because uh, the idea of the Russian immigration uh, in um, many countries was that uh, communism in the country would not hold long. And uh, when uh, children 
would return, they need to know uh, the country of their ethnical background and origin, and they would uh, have to speak Russian and they would know uh, their cultural uh, route. Uh, this was an idea and it was uh, born in Estonia and then spread out to other countries uh, with uh, uh, multiple Russian uh, emigration. And did, did it continue? Did it last beyond the war? It, it, lasted, it lasted for uh, some decades uh, until the Second World War. And then um, it became clear that uh, communism uh, would hold longer and uh, the children grew up in the countries uh, of their uh, in the new countries and uh, they largely uh, adapted the culture of the new countries. Thank you very much. I, I yes, just so, like to, sorry, I'd just like to add to that as a cross-cultural note that when I first started uh, teaching English as a second language to refugees and newcomers in Toronto, um, those programs are actually called mother tongue language instruction. And uh, they do continue to this day based on the multiculturalism policy that was established by Pierre Trudeau in the 1970s in Canada. Very good. Thank you. Celine, you have a question? Yes, uh, Sergei. I was wondering how, um, how Alexander Pushkin is or was regarded under the Soviet government, um, considering that he was a, a kind of a, a, a cultural artist of the imperial Russian times, but he had so many run-ins with Tsar Alexander, that I'm just curious as to how the Soviets regarded him historically and culturally. Okay, uh, I can uh, again refer to my another article, which is called Pushkin against Comintern. And uh, mm, I trace uh, the evolution of um, uh, uh, Pushkin uh, inside the Soviet society. In the first decades um, uh, until the uh, start of the uh, 1930s, he was uh, neglected. He was really a representative of the aristocratic culture which was, which was hostile to the Soviet and the communist authorities and their ideology. And then uh, when the emigrants who lost the uh, military conflict with the communist authorities in Russia, but uh, they were starting to win on the cultural level and they united uh, around Pushkin as their banner, uh, regardless uh, if they belong to some leftist parties or right-wing parties, they were united around Pushkin. And in 1937, uh, uh, they organized international um, celebrations dedicated to uh, how strange it may seem 100 years uh, since his death. Wow. So Stalin's authorities also tried to react and uh, they also accepted Pushkin, except some of his um, uh, later uh, especially religious uh, works and so on. And gradually they uh, were accepted also, uh, especially after the, uh, the so-called patriotic war, 1941, 1945, uh, when uh, some of Russian history was uh, finally rehabilitated by Stalin. So uh, museums uh, were organized uh, in his, uh, uh, in his uh, manners, Mikhailovskoye and Boldino. So the museums were organized there. And uh, he was uh, adopted for uh, studying also in Russian schools, in Soviet schools. Wow. But uh, 
I studied also in uh, Soviet school in, uh, in uh, the 70s. And uh, then uh, we had to learn that he was a friend to revolutionaries. He published uh, uh, some works which were directed against the Tsarist regime and so on. So this was the concept of studying Pushkin uh, until the end of the communism uh, in uh, the USSR. Right. Okay, that makes sense that they would. It makes sense that they would um, emphasize his his activities against the Tsarist uh, regime. Thank you very much. It was really Next interesting. Question. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Anybody else have a question for them? <clears throat> No, I have a question and I don't know the, oh, one second, Anthony, uh, Natalia, you have a question, Natalia uh, Alexandrova? Michael, Michael, it's, Michael, it's not a question, it's probably a comment, so after okay. the questions. Okay, um, I, I help manufacturing companies and I went to a shoe manufacturing company here in Russia uh, about 10 or 12 years ago and I don't, not positive, but I could have swore it was a Bata shoe company. Is there still a Bata shoe company here in Russia currently? Yes, no, anybody no. know? No, okay, all right. I, I was okay. actually from Czech Republic originally, from Moravia. It's a, a small town called Slin, if I'm not mistaken. And then this uh, just went from Czech Republic to Canada. So the, if I'm not mixing it up, it's, I think okay. it came from Czech Republic, went to Canada. And in Czech Republic, the brand exists at least butter. So if you want to can buy butter shoes right now. Okay, I was just curious because I know I went to, a, it was a very small, not big, very small shoe company. I could have swore it was in St. Petersburg, but it could have been outside. And, but it was about 12 years ago. And I don't remember the name, but I, I didn't know by chance, I thought maybe it might be the same name. I had no, I had no idea. Uh, Natalia, your comment, please. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'll get you next, Dan. Dan, you're next. Go ahead, Natalia. Uh, okay. Uh, now, I want to thank the speakers for this wonderful, wonderful contribution uh, into the history of the Pushkin family. Uh, what they did is really very noble, very humane, and very needed uh, because I think that for every Russian, or a person, uh, every, almost every person living in Russia, uh, still the name of Pushkin is very important, uh, almost sacred. And uh, I just remembered that a few years ago, my Rotary Club in Petersburg, Neva, uh, received uh, a great, great granddaughter of Pushkin. Uh, she was our guest and she spoke at our meeting her name is uh, Clotilda von Ritteln. She lives in Germany and she's a baroness. And she's a great person. Uh, she comes to Russia to, with lots of uh, charity. Uh, so uh, she's a very interesting person. And I would even suggest that sometimes we listen to, to her or to someone whom she recommends about the, those numerous descendants of the Pushkin family and uh, what one should do if one finds some documents nowadays, right? Uh, nowadays, what, how those documents should be treated. Maybe there's an easier way to address uh, Pushkin's family tree uh, archives or societies or whatever. Anyway, thank you very much. And thank you, Michael, for organizing okay. this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was Antonina that put it together and she did a great job. Stan, you're next, go ahead, Stanley. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention you about that Bata shoes. Um, one of our participants, Tom Roth, who lives in Portland, right. Oregon area, he mentioned, he wrote a, in the chat that apparently there's a Bata factory in Croatia right now. Mm -hmm. um, he recalls having seen them in Yugoslavia before. So uh, anyway, uh, that was all. 
uh, I have to leave, but I'll be uh, seeing hopefully all of you and many others next week. So yeah, next next week we'll see you for sure, Stan. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Tom. Right. Thomas, yeah, go ahead. The, the there were many Buddhist stores throughout Yugoslavia before the breakup, and I've been to the building, but I do not think that the Bada factory is still. Uh, working, but the building was there the last time I was there, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. Um, yeah. So One. I don't think the factory is there anymore. I don't think it exists. Yeah, just, just a second, Renia. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Renia, go ahead. I just wanted to say that, that Thomas and Sonia Bata became very well-known philanthropists in Toronto and in this area. Um, and uh, Sonia, who was an architect, established the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto. And they launched a really interesting project a number of years ago called the Bata Shoe Project, in which they invited and trained refugee women to talk about the shoes they were wearing when they came to Canada, when they immigrated to Canada. And that project has grown in collaboration with the University of Toronto and has been a, a really um, high quality way of engaging refugee women with their stories. Okay, very good. We have time for one more question. Celine, you had a question? Uh, actually, it's a comment and it's directed to Sergei um, about Pushkin. Uh, um, not only is he well known in, in international literary circles, but as far as uh, Russian music goes, there's kind of two divisions. There's music that is based on Pushkin works and then there's everybody else. So it's, it's uh, not just Eugene Onegin by Tchaikovsky, but also Queen of Spades, Rusalka, uh, Boris Gurunov, of course, um, just, and then all of the, uh, the poetry that was set by major composers, Mussorgsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, Rachmaninoff, um, Tchaikovsky, all, of, he, was, he was like a, a, a lodestone for Russia's great, great, great body of music literature. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you, thank you very, very much. I'm going to ask everybody, we're going to do one more time. Oh, uh, Walter, did you have a question before I close down with them? No? Okay. I'm going to ask everybody to give them a round of applause again. Thank you all very, very much. I think we learned a lot tonight. Maybe in the future, we'll have another cultural evening about Pushkin again, or another famous Russian. And there are many, many, many famous Russians, and we just need to try to bring that culture open. I only wish we had a couple hundred Americans and Canadians here tonight to hear all this. It would have been wonderful for them to hear this. People who maybe don't know Pushkin as well, just heard the name a little bit. Even myself, I don't know a lot about him. I've been to his museum here a few times, learned a little, but still don't know much like you folks do. So very, very happy to hear the stories and increase my knowledge as long with the rest of us on Pushkin. That's very, 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 very nice. We appreciate Thanks all that very, very much. We will, we, will continue, we will continue with tonight's meeting. Um, let me go to the next slide I have here. Um, the project update we have, as of last week, we announced we have two children now. We had Goran and then we got Polina to join him. For those of you who don't know, we are supporting the Cerebral Palsy Center here. It's called the Children's Rehabilitation Center. And we are uh, putting together funds. It costs us about 2,500 euros for each child to get the uh, therapy and everything they need. And we're taking children who come here who cannot walk, either brought in a wheelchair or carried here. And after about three to six months, depending on the severity of the problem, they're able to leave usually walking on their own, probably with braces, maybe some other support function, but still they're able to walk on their own and that is wonderful. So we're supporting them. No new news in the past week. Um, we're still putting together funds from a few of you who donated and other people. Soon as we get up to that 2,500 euro amount again, then we will go find another child there. And there's many, many, many children there waiting. So. Um, it's something that we're actively working on. We just don't have a lot of update for that 
tonight uh, on that. Um, before I go to the schedule of speakers, for my members that I have, uh, for Rami and Kai and Walter, any comments, any news, any information for our club members? Walter, none, yeah, Kai, anything? No? Oh, the extra testing, I'm sorry that I missed last meeting, so uh, right. maybe no. I said it already. There's uh, Andreas who got uh, in the board of this uh, German Chamber of uh, Commerce, uh, the Russian right. German Chamber right. of Commerce. So we had a big event and it was uh, actually right. a few years ago, it would have been a normal event, but now it, it seems so special. <laughs> right. Because so of for the, of it's, uh, right. For those only, of you, those of you here on our screen, if you don't know, one of our members, Andre Bissi, is now on the board of directors of the Russian German Chamber of Commerce. Um, so he was just voted in last week. So it's a rather big caveat for him. That's great, super. Yeah. I'm sure he's going to do a good job at it. And um, and he's um, not even German and not Russian. <laughs> that's right, not German, not Russian, but he, he's in. He's sort of in the middle a little bit there. You know, he kind of got stuck in the middle too. Thank you. Well, Rami, any comments? No? Yes? No comments. Thank you. Thank you. Walter, none. Okay. And uh, Gabriella, you're already one of our honorary members. Any comments there? No, oh, thank you. It was really interesting, but I have no further comments. Okay. All right. And Antonina, coming around the corner very soon, you're going to be one of our honorary members because the paperwork has already started. We're just waiting for it to be finished. So you're going to be brought in as an honorary member very soon. Okay. Because there you've been Thank part you. of us for you've been part of us for a long time and doing a lot of work, so we appreciate all the all the good things you do for you for us. Let me go to the next slide because if you don't remember from what we talked about last week, April is going to be a special month for us. Let me find the right slide if I can find it. No, no, no. Uh, where's my slide? Where's my slide? Where's my slide? Nope. Ah, Michael, what'd you do? Lose your slide? Ah, I know where to find it. I know where to find it. One second, folks. I don't know why it didn't go to my background. It should have gone to my background. Uh, da, da, da. Get out of there. And go here. All right. Oops, how do we get there? That's not what I wanted. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, if I go here. All right, coming up. April is going to be ICC month. Inter-country committee. We're going to we're going to have April in April 7th. Stanley was online here earlier, and so was David. They're going to come with another one more of their friends and they're going to talk about the Russian USA ICC on 7 April. The following week on 14 April, we will have Judy Byron who's going to be talking about the Canadian Russian ICC. And then on the 21st of April, we're going to have George, was it Dentonel? Yeah, George Dentonel. They're going to be talking Not about the Dentonel. 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 Thank you, Gabriella. I, I butcher names terribly. I apologize. I, I'm not good. I'm not a good linguist. Dienenthal. Thank you. He's going to talk about the German Russian ICC. So for three weeks in a row, we're going to hear about the ICC coming from three different connections. And I can tell you in my conversations with uh, the, the American Russian ICC people, Stanley and, and David, they're looking for our club to just help out however possible because there are so many people from around the world who've been coming to our meetings. Tonight, we only got up to a number of 20 total at the, at the high peak of our meeting tonight, but usually we have 35 or 40. So when we have all these people from around the world, it's a great opportunity to hear about what's going on between different countries in Russia and trying to understand the connections that are going on here. So we're working on that. And as we found out in just recent meetings, um, uh, Russia uh, Rotary, Russia, Russia in Rotary, was put on a hiatus uh, six years ago on a trial to see how it was going to go and see how it was going to last. And uh, I don't, it was a six year program, Randall, but I don't remember what year it started. Was that 2020? We're in the second year. 
I'm sorry? We're in the second year now. We're in the second year, all right. So year, that's a pilot district. Right, okay. So we're in that program now and we will see where, where it goes. And folks want to make clubs grow here and want to make Rotary grow here in Russia. So hopefully we're gonna be able to do that. Uh, we need to put a bigger push on it, and that's why we want to get more people involved in it so that we can try to grow Rotary here in Russia some more. So, okay, um, that's all the news that I have. I said this meeting was going to be a little bit shorter. We almost went full length, almost an hour and a half. Um, is there any other comments, closing comments before we close the meeting? Anybody else? Nobody? I would just like to say congratulations yeah. to Dr. Irina, who's our new Dr. Nauk. She wasn't here last week when we announced that. Michael, can I have a word? Go right ahead, young man. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, it's really splendid. The meeting is very nice. And the way the speakers have given the presentations were very good. And one is that uh, Puskin, Irina Puskin's uh, uh, presentation about her details was very heart touching. and. I really like the way Antonina had given the details about it. It was really very nice. And I look forward for the, you gave uh, US, Russia, Canada, Russia, ICC, and then uh, Germany, Russia, ICC, but not India, Russia, ICC. <laughs> <laughs> I had I don't I haven't heard about it, but if you if you got information on it and want to bring it forward, we're certainly open to it. Absolutely. And I've got a question. I've got a question for you. You're Indian there in India. And I was there for a while, but I don't remember when I was in India ever hearing anybody mention the name Pushkin. Do Indians know who Pushkin is? Well, uh, uh, we are learning through such presentation. Otherwise, earlier I was not knowing. Okay. Okay, that's, yes. that's, that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. So yeah. if we can pass information on to anybody, we're happy to do that. But if you got information, if you got information on uh, Indian, Indian Russian ICC, pass it on to us and we'll make a connection with them and see what we can do. Yeah, I love to have it. We're trying, we're trying to open up the connections everywhere we can. Thank you very, very much. And I appreciate you coming all the way in from India tonight because I know you're two and a half hours later than us. So I got 8.30, so you're going on, mid, you're getting on what, 11, 10, 11, 11 o'clock, yeah. almost 11, 11. o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So it's late for you. I appreciate that you staying young. up late. Thank you very, very that much. still young. <laughs> We're all young. Thank you. Okay. All right. If there's no other comments, no other feedback, I'm going to officially close the meeting. The meeting is officially closed. We will be here next week with the United States and Russian ICC speakers. And I'm sure waiting to hear what the heck, see what they got to say, because they're trying to figure out how to help our club and, and how to use our club to make the connections better. So I'm very interested in hearing that. So it, it, it should be good. And Natalia uh, Alexandrov, Androff, yeah. It should be interesting for you also to next week because- uh, Very much so, very much so, yeah. Okay, we will see you all. Bye-bye. Have a good bye evening. Bye-bye.